Chapter 15 of From the Earth to the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Langston. CJLangston.com. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 15. The Fete of the Casting During the eight months which were employed in the work of excavation, the preparatory works of the casting had been carried on simultaneously with extreme rapidity. A stranger arriving at Stones Hill would have been surprised at the spectacle offered to his view. At six hundred yards from the well, and circularly arranged around it as the central point, rose twelve hundred reverberating ovens, each six feet in diameter, and separated from each other by an interval of three feet. The circumference occupied by these twelve hundred ovens presented a length of two miles. Being all constructed on the same plan, each with its high quadrangular chimney, they produced a most singular effect. It will be remembered that on their third meeting the committee had decided to use cast iron for the Columbiad, and in particular the white description. This metal, in fact, is the most tenacious, the most ductile, the most malleable, and consequently suitable for all molding operations, and when smelted with pick hole is of superior quality for all engineering works requiring great resisting power, such as cannon, steam boilers, hydraulic presses, and the like. Cast iron, however, if subjected to only one single fusion, is rarely sufficiently homogeneous, and it requires a second fusion completely to refine it by dispossessing it of its last earthly deposits. So long before being forwarded to Tampa Town, the iron ore, molten in the great furnaces of Cold Spring, and brought into contact with coal and silicum, heated to a high temperature, was carburized and transformed into cast iron. After this first operation, the metal was sent on to Stones Hill. They had, however, to deal with 136 million pounds of iron, a quantity far too costly to send by railway. The cost of transport would have been double that of material. It appeared preferable to freight vessels at New York, and to load them with the iron in bars. This, however, required not less than 68 vessels of 1,000 tons, a veritable fleet which, quitting New York on the 3rd of May, on the 10th of the same month ascended the bay of Espiritu Santo and discharged their cargoes without dues in the port at Tampa Town. Thence the iron was transported by rail to Stones Hill, and about the middle of January this enormous mass of metal was delivered at its destination. It will easily be understood that 1,200 furnaces were not too many to melt simultaneously these 60,000 tons of iron. Each of these furnaces contained nearly 140,000 pounds weight of metal. They were all built after the model of those which served for the casting of the Rodman gun. They were trapezoidal in shape, with a high elliptical arch. These furnaces, constructed of fireproof brick, were specially adapted for burning pit coal, with a flat bottom upon which the iron bars were laid. This bottom, inclined at an angle of 25 degrees, allowed the metal to flow into the receiving troughs, and the 1,200 converging trenches carried the molten metal down to the central well. The day following that on which the works of the masonry and boring had been completed, Barbicane set to work upon the central mold. His object now was to raise within the center of the well, and with a coincident axis, a cylinder 900 feet high and 9 feet in diameter, which should exactly fill up the space reserved for the bore of the Columbiad. This cylinder was composed of a mixture of clay and sand, with the addition of a little hay and straw. The space left between the mold and the masonry was intended to be filled up by the molten metal, which would thus form the walls six feet in thickness. This cylinder, in order to maintain its equilibrium, had to be bound by iron bands, and firmly fixed at certain intervals by cross clamps fastened into the stone lining. After the castings, these would be buried in the block of metal, 
leaving no external projection. This operation was completed on the 8th of July, and the run of the metal was fixed for the following day. This fete of the casting will be a grand ceremony, said J.T. Maston to his friend Barbicane. Undoubtedly, said Barbicane, but it will not be a public fete. What? Will you not open the gates of the enclosure to all comers? I must be very careful, Maston. The casting of the Columbiad is an extremely delicate, not to say a dangerous, operation, and I should prefer its being done privately. At the discharge of the projectile, a fete if you like. Till then, no. The president was right. The operation involved unforeseen dangers, which a great influx of spectators would have hindered him from averting. It was necessary to preserve complete freedom of movement. No one was admitted within the enclosure except a delegation of members of the gun club who had made the voyage to Tampa Town. Among these was the brisk Billsby, Tom Hunter, Colonel Blomsberry, Major Elephantstone, General Morgan, and the rest of the lot to whom the casting of the Columbiad was a matter of personal interest. J.T. Maston became their cicerone. He omitted no point of detail. He conducted them throughout the magazines, workshops, through the midst of the engines, and compelled them to visit the whole 1,200 furnaces one after the other. At the end of the 1,200th visit, they were pretty well knocked up. The casting was to take place at 12 o'clock precisely. The previous evening, each furnace had been charged with 114,000 pounds weight of metal in bars disposed crossways to each other, so as to allow the hot air to circulate freely between them. At daybreak, the 1,200 chimneys vomited their torrents of flame into the air, and the ground was agitated with dull tremblings. As many pounds of metal as there were to cast, so many pounds of coal were there to burn. Thus, there were 68,000 tons of coal, which projected in the face of the sun a thick curtain of smoke. The heat soon became insupportable within the circle of the furnaces, the rumbling of which resembled the rolling of thunder. The powerful ventilators added their continuous blasts and saturated with oxygen the glowing plates. The operation, to be successful, required to be conducted with great rapidity. On a signal given by a cannon shot, each furnace was to give vent to the molten iron and completely to empty itself. These arrangements made, four men and workmen waited the preconcerted moment with an impatience mingled with a certain amount of emotion. Not a soul remained within the enclosure. Each superintendent took his post by the aperture of the run. Barbicane and his colleagues, perched on a neighboring eminence, assisted at the operation. In front of them was a piece of artillery, ready to give fire on the signal from the engineer. Some minutes before midday, the first driblets of metal began to flow. The reservoirs filled little by little, and, by the time that the whole melting was completely accomplished, it was kept in abeyance for a few minutes in order to facilitate the separation of foreign substances. Twelve o'clock struck. A gunshot suddenly peeled forth and shot its flame into the air. Twelve hundred melting troughs were simultaneously opened, and twelve hundred fiery serpents crept toward the central well, unrolling their incandescent curves. There, down they plunged with a terrific noise into a depth of nine hundred feet. It was an exciting and a magnificent spectacle. The ground trembled while these molten waves, launching into the sky their wreaths of smoke, evaporated the moisture of the mold and hurled it upward through the vent holes of the stone lining in the form of dense vapor clouds. These artificial clouds unrolled their thick spirals to a height of 1,000 yards into the air. A savage, wandering somewhere beyond the limits of the horizon, might have believed that some new crater was forming in the bosom of Florida although there was neither any eruption, nor typhoon, nor storm, nor struggle of the elements, nor any of those terrible phenomena which nature is capable of producing. No, it was man alone who had produced these reddish vapors, these gigantic flames worthy of a volcano itself, these tremendous vibrations resembling the shock of an earthquake, these reverberations rivaling those of hurricanes and storms, 
and it was his hand which precipitated into an abyss, dug by himself, a whole Niagara of molten metal. End of chapter 15「Chapters sixteen and seventeen of From the Earth to the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter sixteen The Columbiad. Had the casting succeeded? They were reduced to mere conjecture. There was, indeed, every reason to expect success, since the mold had absorbed the entire mass of the molten metal. Still, some considerable time must elapse before they could arrive at any certainty upon the matter. The patience of the members of the gun club was sorely tried during this period of time. But they could do nothing. J. T. Maston escaped roasting by a miracle. Fifteen days after the casting an immense column of smoke was still rising in the open sky, and the ground burned the soles of the feet within a radius of two hundred feet round the summit of Stones Hill. It was impossible to approach nearer. All they could do was to wait with what patience they might. "'Here we are at the tenth of August,' exclaimed J. T. Maston one morning. Only four months to the first of December. We shall never be ready in time. Barbicane said nothing, but his silence covered serious irritation. However, daily observations revealed a certain change going on in the state of the ground. About the 15th of August, the vapors ejected had sensibly diminished in intensity and thickness. Some days afterward, the earth exhaled only a slight puff of smoke the last breath of the monster enclosed within its circle of stone. Little by little the belt of heat contracted, until, on the 22nd of August, Barbicane, his colleagues, and the engineer were enabled to set foot on the iron sheet which lay level upon the summit of Stones Hill. "'At last!' exclaimed the president of the gun club, with an immense sigh of relief. The work was resumed the same day. They proceeded at once to extract the interior mold for the purpose of clearing out the boring of the piece. Pickaxes and boring irons were set to work without intermission. The clayey and sandy soils had acquired extreme hardness under the action of the heat, but by the aid of the machines the rubbish on being dug out was rapidly carted away on railway wagons, and such was the ardor of the work, so persuasive the arguments of Barbicane's dollars, that by the 3rd of September all traces of the mold had entirely disappeared. Immediately the operation of boring was commenced, and by the aid of powerful machines, a few weeks later, the inner surface of the immense tube had been rendered perfectly cylindrical, and the bore of the piece had acquired a thorough polish. At length, on the 22nd of September, less than a twelve-month after Barbicane's original proposition, the enormous weapon, accurately bored, and exactly vertically pointed, was ready for work. There was only the moon now to wait for, and they were pretty sure that she would not fail in the rendezvous. The ecstasy of J. T. Maston knew no bounds, and he narrowly escaped a frightful fall while staring down the tube. But for the strong hand of Colonel Bloomsbury, the worthy secretary, like a modern Aristratus, would have found his death in the depths of the Columbiad. The cannon was then finished. There was no possible doubt as to its perfect completion. So, on the 6th of October, Captain Nicholl opened an account between himself and President Barbicane, in which he debited himself to the latter in the sum of two thousand dollars. One may believe that the captain's wrath was increased to its highest point, and must have made him seriously ill. However, he had still three bets of three, four, and five thousand dollars, respectively, and if he gained two out of these, his position would not be very bad. But the money question did not enter into his calculations. It was the success of his rival in casting a cannon against which iron plates sixty feet thick would have been ineffectual that dealt him a terrible blow. 
After the 23rd of September, the enclosure of Stones Hill was thrown open to the public, and it will be easily imagined what was the concourse of visitors to this spot. There was an incessant flow of people to and from Tampa Town and the place, which resembled a procession, or rather, in fact, a pilgrimage. It was already clear to be seen that, on the day of the experiment itself, the aggregate of spectators would be counted by millions, for they were already arriving from all parts of the earth upon this narrow strip of promontory. Europe was emigrating to America. Up to that time, however, it must be confessed, the curiosity of the numerous comers was but scantily gratified. Most had counted upon witnessing the spectacle of the casting, and they were treated to nothing but smoke. This was sorry food for hungry eyes, but Barbicane would admit no one to that operation. Then ensued grumbling, discontent, murmurs. They blamed the president, taxed him with dictatorial conduct. His proceedings were declared un-American. There was very nearly a riot round Stones Hill, but Barbicane remained inflexible. When, however, the Columbiad was entirely finished, this state of closed doors could no longer be maintained. Besides, it would have been bad taste, and even imprudence, to affront the public feeling. Barbicane, therefore, opened the enclosure to all comers, but, true to his practical disposition, he determined to coin money out of the public curiosity. It was something, indeed, to be enabled to contemplate this immense Columbiad, but to descend into its depths, this seemed to the Americans the ne plus ultra of earthly felicity. Consequently, there was not one curious spectator who was not willing to give himself the treat of visiting the interior of this great metallic abyss. Baskets suspended from steam cranes permitted them to satisfy their curiosity. There was a perfect mania. Women, children, old men, all made it a point of duty to penetrate the mysteries of the colossal gun. The fare for the descent was fixed at five dollars per head, and despite this high charge, during the two months which preceded the experiment, the influx of visitors enabled the gun club to pocket nearly five hundred thousand dollars. It is needless to say that the first visitors of the Columbiad were the members of the gun club. This privilege was justly reserved for that illustrious body. The ceremony took place on the 25th of September. A basket of honor took down the President, J.T. Maston, Major Elphinstone, General Morgan, Colonel Bloomsbury, and other members of the club, to the number of ten in all. How hot it was at the bottom of that long tube of metal! They were half suffocated. But what delight! What ecstasy! A table had been laid with six covers on the massive stone which formed the bottom of the Columbiad, and lighted by a jet of electric light, resembling that of day itself. Numerous exquisite dishes, which seemed to descend from heaven, were placed successively before the guests, and the richest wines of France flowed in profusion during this splendid repast, served nine hundred feet beneath the surface of the earth. The festival was animated, not to say somewhat noisy. Toasts flew backward and forward. They drank to the earth and to her satellite, to the gun club, the union, the moon, Diana, Phoebe, Selene, the peaceful courier of the night. All the hurrahs, carried upward upon the sonorous waves of the immense acoustic tube, arrived with the sound of thunder at its mouth, and the multitude ranged round Stones Hill heartily united their shouts with those of the ten revelers hidden from view at the bottom of the gigantic Columbiad. J. T. Maston was no longer master of himself. Whether he shouted or gesticulated, ate or drank most, would be a difficult matter to determine. At all events, he would not have given his place up for an empire, not even if the cannon, loaded, primed, and fired at that very moment, were to blow him in pieces into the planetary world. CHAPTER Seventeen, A TELEGRAPHIC DISPATCH The great works undertaken by the gun club had now virtually come to an end, and two months still remained before the day for the discharge of the shot to the moon. To the general impatience these two months appeared as long as years. Hitherto the smallest details of the operation had been daily chronicled by the journals, 
which the public devoured with eager eyes. Just at this moment a circumstance, the most unexpected, the most extraordinary and incredible, occurred to rouse afresh their panting spirits, and to throw every mind into a state of the most violent excitement. One day, the 30th of September, at 3.47 p.m., a telegram, transmitted by cable from Valencia, Ireland, to Newfoundland and the American mainland, arrived at the address of President Barbicane. The President tore open the envelope, read the dispatch, and, despite his remarkable powers of self-control, his lips turned pale and his eyes grew dim on reading the twenty words of this telegram. Here is the text of the dispatch, which figures now in the archives of the Gun Club. France, Paris, 30 September, 4 a.m. Barbicane, Tampa Town, Florida, United States. Substitute for your spherical shell a cylindro-conical projectile. I shall go inside. Shall arrive by steamer Atlanta. Michel Ardan. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of From the Earth to the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter eighteen. The Passenger of the Atlanta. If this astounding news instead of flying through the electric wires, had simply arrived by post in the ordinary sealed envelope, Barbicane would not have hesitated a moment. He would have held his tongue about it, both as a measure of prudence, and in order not to have to reconsider his plans. This telegram might be a cover for some jest, especially as it came from a Frenchman. What human being would ever have conceived the idea of such a journey? And, if such a person really existed, he must be an idiot, whom one would shut up in a lunatic ward, rather than within the walls of the projectile. The contents of the dispatch, however, speedily became known, for the telegraphic officials possessed but little discretion, and Michel Ardan's proposition ran at once throughout the several states of the Union. Barbicane had, therefore, no further motives for keeping silence. Consequently, he called together such of his colleagues as were at the moment in Tampa Town, and without any expression of his own opinions, simply read to them the laconic text itself. It was received with every possible variety of expressions of doubt, incredulity, and derision from every one without the exception of J. T. Marston, who exclaimed, "'It is a grand idea, however!' When Barbicane originally proposed to send a shot to the moon, everyone looked upon the enterprise as simple and practicable enough, a mere question of gunnery. But when a person, professing to be a reasonable being, offered to take passage within the projectile, the whole thing became a farce, or, in plainer language, a humbug. One question, however, remained. Did such a being exist? This telegram flashed across the depths of the Atlantic, the designation of the vessel on board which he was to take his passage, the date assigned for his speedy arrival, all combined to impart a certain character of reality to the proposal. They must get some clearer notion of the matter, Scattered groups of inquirers at length condensed themselves into a compact crowd, which made straight for the residence of President Barbicane. That worthy individual was keeping quiet with the intention of watching events as they arose. But he had forgotten to take into account the public impatience, and it was with no pleasant countenance that he watched the population of Tampa Town gathering under his windows. The murmurs and vociferations below presently obliged him to appear. He came forward, therefore, and, on silence being procured, 
a citizen put point-blank to him the following question. Is the person mentioned in the telegram, under the name of Michel Arden, on his way here? Yes or no? Gentlemen, replied Barbicane, I know no more than you do. We must know, roared the impatient voices. Time will show, calmly replied the President. Time has no business to keep the whole country in suspense, replied the orator. Have you altered the plans of the projectile according to the request of the telegram? Not yet, gentlemen, but you are right. We must have better information to go by. The telegraph must complete its information. To the telegraph, roared the crowd. Barbicane descended, and heading the immense assemblage, led the way to the telegraph office. A few minutes later a telegram was dispatched to the secretary of the underwaters at Liverpool, requesting answers to the following queries. About the ship Atlanta. When did she leave Europe? Had she on board a Frenchman named Michel Ardan? Two hours afterwards Barbicane received information too exact to leave room for the smallest remaining doubt. The steamer Atlanta from Liverpool put to sea on the 2nd of October, bound for Tampa Town. Having on board a Frenchman born on the list of passengers by the name of Michel Ardan, that very evening he wrote to the house of Bredwell & Co., requesting them to suspend the casting of the projectile until the receipt of further orders. On the 10th of October, at 9 a.m., the semaphores of the Bahama Canal signalled a thick smoke on the horizon. Two hours later, a large steamer exchanged signals with them. The name of the Atlanta flew at once over Tampa Town. At four o'clock, the English vessel entered the Bay of Espiritu Santo. At five, it crossed the passage of Hillsborough Bay at full steam. At six, she cast anchor at Port Tampa. The anchor had scarcely caught the sandy bottom, when five hundred boats surrounded the Atlanta, and the steamer was taken by assault. Barbicane was the first to set foot on deck, and in a voice of which he vainly tried to conceal the emotion, called Michel Ardan. Here, replied an individual perched on the poop. Barbicane, with arms crossed, looked fixedly at the passenger of the Atlanta. He was a man of about forty-two years of age, of large build, but slightly round-shouldered. His massive head momentarily shook a shock of reddish hair, which resembled a lion's mane. His face was short with a broad forehead, and furnished with a moustache as bristly as a cat's, and little patches of yellowish whiskers upon his full cheeks. Round, wildish eyes, slightly near-sighted, completed a physiognomy essentially feline. His nose was firmly shaped, his mouth particularly sweet in expression, high forehead, intelligent and furrowed with wrinkles like a newly ploughed field. The body was powerfully developed and firmly fixed upon long legs. Muscular arms and a general air of decision gave him the appearance of a hardy, jolly companion. He was dressed in a suit of ample dimensions, loose neckerchief, open shirt collar, disclosing a robust neck. His cuffs were invariably unbuttoned, through which appeared a pair of red hands. On the bridge of the steamer, in the midst of the crowd, he bustled to and fro, never still for a moment, dragging his anchors, as the sailors say, gesticulating, making free with everybody, biting his nails with nervous avidity. He was one of those originals which nature sometimes invents, in the freak of a moment, and of which she then breaks the mould. Among other peculiarities, this curiosity gave himself out for a sublime ignoramus. Like Shakespeare, and professed supreme contempt for all scientific men. Those fellows, as he called them, are only fit to mark the points while we play the game. He was, in fact, a thorough bohemian, adventurous but not an adventurer, a hare-brained fellow, a kind of Icarus, only possessing relays of wings. For the rest, he was ever in scrapes, ending invariably by falling on his feet, like those little figures which they sell for children's toys. 
In a few words, his motto was, I have my opinions, and the love of the impossible constituted his ruling passion. Such was the passenger of the Atlanta, always excitable, as if boiling under the action of some internal fire by the character of his physical organization. If ever two individuals offered a striking contrast to each other, these were certainly Michel Ardan and the Yankee Barbicane, both, moreover, being equally enterprising and daring, each in his own way. The scrutiny which the president of the gun club had instituted regarding this new rival was quickly interrupted by the shouts and hurrahs of the crowd. The cries became at last so uproarious, and the popular enthusiasm assumed so personal a form, that Michel Ardan, after having shaken hands some thousands of times, at the imminent risk of leaving his fingers behind him, was fain at last to make a bolt for his cabin. Barbicane followed him without uttering a word. "'You are Barbicane, I suppose?' said Michel Ardan, in a tone of voice in which he would have addressed a friend of twenty years standing. "'Yes,' replied the President of the Gun Club. "'All right. How do you do, Barbicane? How are you getting on? Pretty well, that's right.' "'So,' said Barbicane, without further preliminary, "'you are quite determined to go?' "'Quite decided. Nothing will stop you? Nothing. Have you modified your projectile according to my telegram?' "'I have waited for your arrival, but,' asked Barbicane again, "'have you carefully reflected?' "'Reflected? Have I any time to spare? "'I find an opportunity of making a tour in the moon, "'and I mean to profit by it. "'There is the whole gist of the matter.' "'Barbicane looked hard at this man "'who spoke so lightly of his project, "'with such complete absence of anxiety. "'But at least,' said he, "'You have some plans, some means of carrying your project into execution?' "'Excellent, my dear Barbicane. Only permit me to offer one remark. My wish is to tell my story once and for all, to everybody, and then have done with it. Then there will be no need for recapitulation. So, if you have no objection, assemble your friends, colleagues, the whole town, all of Florida, all America if you like, and tomorrow I shall be ready to explain my plans and answer any objections, whatever that may be advanced. You may rest assured I shall wait without stirring. Will that suit you? All right, replied Barbicane. So saying, the President left the cabin, and informed the crowd of the proposal of Michel Ardan. His words were received with clappings of hands and shouts of joy. They had removed all difficulties. Tomorrow every one would contemplate at his ease this European hero. However, some of the spectators, more infatuated than the rest, would not leave the deck of the Atlanta. They passed the night on board. Among others, J. T. Marston got his hook fixed in the combing of the poop, and it pretty nearly required the capstan to get it out again. "'He is a hero, a hero!' he cried a theme of which he was never tired of ringing the changes, and we are only like weak, silly women compared with this European. As to the President, after having suggested to the visitors it was time to retire, he re-entered the passenger's cabin, and remained there till the bell of the steamer made its midnight. But then the two rivals in popularity shook hands heartily, and parted on terms of intimate friendship. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of From the Earth to the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 19 A Monster Meeting. On the following day, Barbicane, fearing that indiscreet questions might be put to Michael Arden, was desirous of reducing the number of the audience to a few of the initiated, his own colleagues, for instance. He might as well have tried to check the falls of Niagara. He was compelled, therefore, to give up the idea, and let his new friend run the chances of a public conference. The place chosen for this monster meeting was a vast plain situated in the rear of the town. 
In a few hours, thanks to the help of the shipping in port, an immense roofing of canvas was stretched over the parched prairie, and protected it from the burning rays of the sun. There, three hundred thousand people braved for many hours the stifling heat while awaiting the arrival of the Frenchmen. Of this crowd of spectators, a first set could both see and hear, a second set saw badly and heard nothing at all, and as for the third, it could neither see nor hear anything at all. At three o'clock, Michael Arden made his appearance, accompanied by the principal members of the gun club. He was supported on his right by President Barbicane, and on his left by J. T. Maston, more radiant than the midday sun, and nearly as ruddy. Arden mounted a platform, from the top of which his view extended over a sea of black hats. He exhibited not the slightest embarrassment. He was just as gay, familiar, and pleasant as if he were at home. To the hurrahs which greeted him he replied by a graceful bow. Then, waving his hands to request silence, he spoke in perfectly correct English as follows. "'Gentlemen, despite the very hot weather, I request your patience for a short time, while I offer some explanations regarding the projects which seem to have so interested you. I am neither an orator nor a man of science, and I had no idea of addressing you in public. But my friend Barbicane has told me that you would like to hear me, and I am quite at your service. Listen to me, therefore, with your six hundred thousand ears, and please excuse the faults of the speaker.' Now pray do not forget that you see before you a perfect ignoramus whose ignorance goes so far that he cannot even understand the difficulties. It seemed to him that it was a matter quite simple, natural, and easy to take one's place in a projectile and start for the moon. That journey must be undertaken sooner or later, and, as for the mode of locomotion adopted, it follows simply the law of progress. Man began walking on all fours, then, one fine day, on two feet, then in a carriage, then in a stage-coach, and lastly by railway. Well, the projectile is the vehicle of the future, and the planets themselves are nothing else. Now, some of you gentlemen may imagine that the velocity we propose to impart to it is extravagant. It is nothing of the kind. All the stars exceed it in rapidity, and the earth herself is at this moment carrying us around the sun at three times as rapid a rate, and yet she is a mere lounger on the way compared with many other of the planets, and her velocity is constantly decreasing. Is it not evident, then, I ask you, that there will some day appear velocities far greater than these, of which light or electricity will probably be the mechanical agent? Yes, gentlemen, continued the orator, in spite of the opinions of certain narrow-minded people who would shut up the human race upon this globe, as within some magical circle which it must never outstep, we shall one day travel to the moon, the planets and the stars, with the same facility, rapidity, and certainty as we now make the voyage from Liverpool to New York. Distance is but a relative expression, and must end by being reduced to zero. The assembly, strongly predisposed, as they were in favour of the French hero, were slightly staggered at this bold theory. Michael Arden perceived the fact. Gentlemen, he continued with a pleasant smile, you do not seem quite convinced. Very good. Let us reason the matter out. Do you know how long it would take for an express train to reach the moon? Three hundred days, no more. And what is that? The distance is no more than nine times the circumference of the earth, and there are no sailors or travellers of even moderate activity who have not made longer journeys than that in their lifetime. And now consider that I shall be only ninety-seven hours on my journey. Ah, I see you are reckoning that the moon is a long way off from the earth, and that one must think twice before making the experiment. What would you say, then, if we were talking of going to Neptune? which revolves at a distance of more than two thousand seven hundred and twenty million miles from the sun. And yet, what is that compared with the distance of the fixed stars, some of which, such as Arcturus, are billions of miles distant from us? And then, you talk of the distance 
which separates the planets from the sun. And there are people who affirm that such a thing as distance exists. Absurdity, folly, idiotic nonsense. Would you know what I think of our own solar universe? Shall I tell you my theory? It is very simple. In my opinion, the solar system is a solid, homogeneous body. The planets which compose it are in actual contact with each other. And whatever space exists between them is nothing more than the space which separates the molecules of the densest metal, such as silver, iron, or platinum. I have the right, therefore, to affirm, and I repeat, with the conviction which must penetrate all your minds, distance is but an empty name. Distance does not really exist. Hurrah! cried one voice. Need it be said that it was that of J.T. Maston. Distance does not exist! And overcome by the energy of his movements, he nearly fell from the platform to the ground. He just escaped a severe fall, which would have proved to him that distance was by no means an empty name. Gentlemen, resumed the orator, I repeat that the distance between the earth and her satellite is a mere trifle, and undeserving of serious consideration. I am convinced that before twenty years are over, one half of our earth will have paid a visit to the moon. Now, my worthy friends, if you have any question to put to me, you will, I fear, sadly embarrass a poor man like myself. Still, I will do my best to answer you. Up to this point, the president of the gun club had been satisfied with the turn which the discussion had assumed. It became now, however, desirable to divert Arden from questions of a practical nature, with which he was doubtless far less conversant. Barbicane, therefore, hastened to get in a word, and began by asking his new friend whether he thought that the moon and planets were inhabited. "'You put before me a great problem, my worthy president,' replied the orator, smiling. "'Still, men of great intelligence, such as Plutarch, Swedenborg, Bernardin de Saint-Pierre, and others have, if I mistake not, pronounced in the affirmative, looking at the question from the natural philosopher's point of view.' I should say that nothing useless existed in the world, and, replying to your question by another, I should venture to assert that if these worlds are habitable, they either are, have been, or will be inhabited. No one could answer more logically or fairly, replied the President. The question then reverts to this. Are these worlds habitable? For my own part, I believe they are. For myself, I feel certain of it, said Michael Arden. "'Nevertheless,' retorted one of the audience, "'there are many arguments against the habitability of the worlds. "'The conditions of life must evidently be greatly modified upon the majority of them. "'To mention only the planets, we should be either broiled alive in some, "'or frozen to death in others, according as they are more or less removed from the sun.' "'I regret,' replied Michael Arden, "'that I have not the honour of personally knowing my contradictor.' for i would have attempted to answer him his objections has its merits i admit but i think we may successfully combat it as well as all others which affect the habitability of other worlds if i were a natural philosopher i would tell him that if less of caloric were set in motion upon the planets which are nearest to the sun and more on the contrary upon those which are the furthest removed from it this simple fact would alone suffice to equalize the heat, and to render the temperature of those worlds supportable by beings organized like ourselves. If I were a naturalist, I would tell him that, according to some illustrious men of science, nature has furnished us with instances upon the earth of animals existing under very varying conditions of life, that fish respire in a medium fatal to other animals, that amphibious creatures possess a double existence very difficult of explanation, that certain denizens of the seas maintain life at enormous depths, and there support a pressure equal to that of fifty or sixty atmospheres without being crushed, that several aquatic insects, insensible to temperature, are met with equally among boiling springs and in the frozen plains of the polar sea. In fine, we cannot help recognizing in nature a diversity of means of operation oftentimes incomprehensible, but not the less real, 
If I were a chemist, I would tell him that the aerolites, bodies evidently formed exteriorly of our terrestrial globe, have, upon analysis, revealed indisputable traces of carbon, a substance which owes its origin solely to organized beings, and which, according to the experiments of Reichenbach, must necessarily itself have been endued with animation. And lastly, were I a theologian, I would tell him that the scheme of the divine redemption, according to St. Paul, seems to be applicable, not merely to the earth, but to all the celestial worlds. But unfortunately, I am neither theologian, nor chemist, nor naturalist, nor philosopher. Therefore, in my absolute ignorance of the great laws which govern the universe, I confine myself to saying in reply, I do not know whether the worlds are inhabited or not, and since I do not know, I am going to see. Whether Michael Arden's antagonist hazarded any further arguments or not, it is impossible to say, for the uproarious shouts of the crowd would not allow any expression of opinion to gain a hearing. On silence being restored, the triumphant orator contented himself with adding the following remarks. Gentlemen, you will observe that I have but slightly touched upon this great question. There is another altogether different line of argument in favour of the habitability of the stars, which I omit for the present. I only desire to call attention to one point. To those who maintain that the planets are not inhabited, one may reply, You might be perfectly in the right, if you could only show that the earth is the best possible world, in spite of what Voltaire has said. She has but one satellite, while Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, Neptune have each several, an advantage by no means to be despised. But that which renders our own globe so uncomfortable is the inclination of its axis to the plane of its orbit. Hence the inequality of days and nights, hence the disagreeable diversity of the seasons. On the surface of our unhappy spheroid we are always either too hot or too cold, we are frozen in winter, broiled in summer, it is the planet of rheumatism, coughs, bronchitis, while on the surface of Jupiter, for example, where the axis is but slightly inclined, the inhabitants may enjoy uniform temperatures. It possesses zones of perpetual springs, summers, autumns, and winters. Every Jovian may choose for himself what climate he likes, and there spend the whole of his life in security from all variations of temperature. You will, I am sure, readily admit this superiority of Jupiter over our own planet, to say nothing of his years, which equal twelve of ours. Under such auspices, and such marvellous conditions of existence, it appears to me that the inhabitants of so fortunate a world must be in every respect superior to ourselves. All we require, in order to attain such perfection, is the mere trifle of having an axis of rotation, less inclined to the plane of its orbit. Hurrah! roared an energetic voice. Let us unite our efforts, invent the necessary machines, and rectify the earth's axis. A thunder of applause followed this proposal, the author of which, of course, was no other than J. T. Maston and in all probability, if the truth must be told, if the Yankees could have only found a point of application for it, they would have constructed a lever capable of raising the earth and rectifying its axis. It was just this deficiency which baffled these daring mechanicians. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of From the Earth to the moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meredith Hughes, Cambridge, Massachusetts. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 20 Attack and Repost. As soon as the excitement had subsided, the following words were heard uttered in a strong and determined voice. Now that the speaker has favoured us with so much imagination, would he be so good as to return to his subject and give us a little practical view of the question? 
All eyes were directed towards the person who spoke. He was a little dried-up man, of an active figure, with an American goatee beard. Profiting by the different movements in the crowd, he had managed by degrees to gain the front row of spectators. There, with arms crossed and stern gaze, he watched the hero of the meeting. After having put his question, he remained silent, and appeared to take no notice of the thousands of looks directed toward himself, nor of the murmur of disapprobation excited by his words. Meeting at first with no reply, he repeated his question with marked emphasis, adding, "'We are here to talk about the moon, and not about the earth.' "'You are right, sir,' replied Michael Arden. "'The discussion has become irregular. We will return to the moon.' "'Sir,' said the unknown, "'you pretend that our satellite is inhabited. "'Very good, but if selenites do exist, "'that race of beings assuredly must live without breathing, "'for, I warn you for your own sake, "'there is not the smallest particle of air on the surface of the moon.' "'At this remark, Arden pushed up his shock of red hair. "'He saw that he was on the point of being involved in a struggle with this person "'upon the very gist of the whole question.' He looked sternly at him in his turn, and said, "'Oh, so there is no air in the moon? And pray, if you are so good, who ventures to affirm that?' "'The men of science.' "'Really?' "'Sir,' replied Michael, "'pleasantry apart, I have a profound respect for men of science who do possess science, but a profound contempt for men of science who do not.' "'Do you know any who belong to the latter category?' Decidedly, in France there are some who maintain that, mathematically, a bird cannot possibly fly, and others who demonstrate, theoretically, that fishes were never made to live in water. I have nothing to do with persons of that description, and I can quote, in support of my statement, names which you cannot refuse deference to. Then, sir, you will sadly embarrass a poor ignorant who, besides, asks nothing better than to learn." "'Why, then, do you introduce scientific questions if you have never studied them?' asked the unknown, somewhat coarsely. "'For the reason that he is always brave who never suspects danger. I know nothing, it is true, but it is precisely my very weakness which constitutes my strength.' "'Your weakness amounts to folly,' retorted the unknown in a passion. "'All the better,' replied our Frenchman, "'if it carries me up to the moon.' Barbicane and his colleagues devoured with their eyes the intruder who had so boldly placed himself in antagonism to their enterprise. Nobody knew him, and the President, uneasy as to the result of so free a discussion, watched his new friend with some anxiety. The meeting began to be somewhat fidgety also, for the contest directed their attention to the dangers, if not the actual impossibilities, of the proposed expedition. "'Sir,' replied Arden's antagonist, there are many and incontrovertible reasons which prove the absence of an atmosphere in the moon. I might say that, a priori, if one ever did exist, it must have been absorbed by the earth. But I prefer to bring forward indisputable facts. Bring them forward, then, sir, as many as you please. You know, said the stranger, that when any luminous rays cross a medium such as the air, they are deflected out of the straight line. In other words, they undergo refraction. Well— when stars are occulted by the moon, their rays, on grazing the edge of her disk, exhibit not the least deviation, nor offer the slightest indication of refraction. It follows, therefore, that the moon cannot be surrounded by an atmosphere. "'In point of fact,' replied Arden, "'this is your chief, if not your only argument, and a really scientific man might be puzzled to answer it. For myself, I will simply say that it is defective, because it assumes that the angular diameter of the moon has been completely determined, which is not the case. But let us proceed. Tell me, my dear sir, do you admit the existence of volcanoes on the moon's surface? Extinct, yes. Inactivity, no. These volcanoes, however, were at one time in a state of activity. True, but, as they furnish themselves the oxygen necessary for combustion, the mere fact of their eruption does not prove the presence of an atmosphere. Proceed again, then, and let us set aside this class of arguments in order to come to direct observations. In 1715, the astronomers Louville and Halley, watching the eclipse of the 3rd of May, 
remarked some very extraordinary scintillations. These jets of light, rapid in nature, and of frequent recurrence, they attributed to thunderstorms generated in the lunar atmosphere. In 1715, replied the unknown, the astronomers Louville and Halley mistook for lunar phenomena some which were purely terrestrial, such as meteoric or other bodies which are generated in our own atmosphere. This was the scientific explanation at the time of the facts, and that is my answer now. On again, then, replied Arden. Herschel, in 1718, observed a great number of luminous points on the moon's surface, did he not? Yes, but without offering any solution of them. Herschel himself never inferred from them the necessity of a lunar atmosphere. And I may add that Baer and Medler, two great authorities upon the moon, are quite agreed as to the entire absence of air upon its surface. A movement was here manifest among the assemblage, who appeared to be growing excited by the arguments of this singular personage. "'Let us proceed,' replied Arden, with perfect coolness, "'and come to one important fact. "'A skilful French astronomer, Monsieur Lacedat, "'in watching the eclipse of July 18, 1860, "'proved that the horns of the lunar crescent "'were rounded and truncated. "'Now, this appearance could only have been produced "'by a deviation of the solar rays "'in traversing the atmosphere of the moon. "'There is no other possible explanation of the facts.' "'But this is established as a fact?' "'Absolutely certain.' A counter-movement here took place in favour of the hero of the meeting, whose opponent was now reduced to silence. Arden resumed the conversation, and, without exhibiting any exultation at the advantage he had gained, simply said, "'You see, then, my dear sir, we must not pronounce with absolute positiveness against the existence of an atmosphere in the moon. That atmosphere is, probably, of extreme rarity. Nevertheless, at the present day, science generally admits that it exists.' "'Not in the mountains, at all event,' returned the unknown, unwilling to give in. "'No, but at the bottom of valleys, and not exceeding a few hundred feet in height. "'In any case, you will do well to take every precaution, for the air will be terribly rarefied. "'My good sir, there will always be enough for a solitary individual. "'Besides, once arrived up there, I shall do my best to economize, and not to breathe except on grand occasions.' A tremendous roar of laughter rang in the ears of the mysterious interlocutor, who glared fiercely round upon the assembly. "'Then,' continued Arden, with a careless air, "'since we are in accord regarding the presence of a certain atmosphere, we are forced to admit the presence of a certain quantity of water. This is a happy consequence for me. Moreover, my amiable contradictor, permit me to submit to you one further observation. We only know one side of the moon's disk.' and if there is but little air on the face presented to us, it is possible that there is plenty on the one turned away from us. And for what reason? Because the moon, under the action of the earth's attraction, has assumed the form of an egg, which we look at from the smaller end. Hence it follows, by Hausen's calculations, that its centre of gravity is situated in the other hemisphere. Hence it results that the great mass of air and water must have been drawn away to the other face of our satellite during the first days of its creation. "'Pure fancies!' cried the unknown. "'No, pure theories, which are based upon the laws of mechanics, and it seems difficult to me to refute them. I appeal, then, to this meeting, and I put it to them whether life, such as exists upon the earth, is possible upon the surface of the moon.' Three hundred thousand auditors at once applauded the proposition. Arden's opponent tried to get in another word, but he could not obtain a hearing. Cries and menaces fell upon him like hail. "'Enough! Enough!' cried some. "'Drive the intruder off!' shouted others. "'Turn him out!' roared the exasperated crowd. But he, holding firmly on to the platform, did not budge an inch and let the storm pass on, which would soon have assumed formidable proportions if Michael Arden had not quieted it by a gesture. He was too chivalrous to abandon his opponent in an apparent extremity. "'You wish to say a few more words?' he asked, in a pleasant voice. "'Yes, a thousand, or rather, no, only one. If you persevere in your enterprise, you must be a—' "'Very rash person,' 
how can you treat me as such? Me, who have demanded a cylindro-conical projectile in order to prevent turning round and round on my way like a squirrel? But, unhappy man, the dreadful recoil will smash you to pieces at your starting. My dear contradictor, you have just put your finger upon the true and only difficulty. Nevertheless, I have too good an opinion of the industrial genius of the Americans not to believe that they will succeed in overcoming it. But the heat developed by the rapidity of the projectile in crossing the strata of air. Oh, the walls are thick, and I shall soon have crossed the atmosphere. But victuals and water! I have calculated for a twelve-month supply, and I shall be only four days on the journey. But for air to breathe on the road. I shall make it by a chemical process. But your fall on the moon, supposing you ever reach it. It will be six times less dangerous than a sudden fall upon the earth, because the weight will be only one-sixth as great on the surface of the moon. Still, it will be enough to smash you like glass. What is to prevent my retarding the shock by means of rockets conveniently placed and lighted at the right moment? But after all, supposing all difficulties surmounted, all obstacles removed, supposing everything combined to favor you— and granting that you may arrive safe and sound in the moon, how will you come back? I am not coming back. At this reply, almost sublime in its very simplicity, the assembly became silent. But its silence was more eloquent than could have been its cries of enthusiasm. The unknown profited by the opportunity, and once more protested. "'You will inevitably kill yourself!' he cried, and your death will be that of a madman, useless even to science. Go on, my dear unknown, for truly your prophecies are most agreeable. It really is too much, cried Michael Arden's adversary. I do not know why I should continue so frivolous a discussion. Please yourself about this insane expedition. We need not trouble ourselves about you. Pray, don't stand upon ceremony. No, another person is responsible for your act. "'Who, may I ask?' demanded Michael Arden, in an imperious tone. "'The ignoramus who organized this equally absurd and impossible experiment.' The attack was direct. Barbicane, ever since the interference of the unknown, had been making fearful efforts of self-control. Now, however, seeing himself directly attacked, he could restrain himself no longer. He rose suddenly, and was rushing upon the enemy who thus braved him to the face— when all at once he found himself separated from him. The platform was lifted by a hundred strong arms, and the president of the gun club shared with Michael Arden triumphal honors. The shield was heavy, but the bearers came in continuous relays, disputing, struggling, even fighting among themselves in their eagerness to lend their shoulders to this demonstration. But the unknown had not profited by the tumult to quit his post. Besides, he could not have done— in the midst of that compact crowd. There he held on in the front row with crossed arms, glaring at President Barbicane. The shouts of the immense crowd continued at their highest pitch throughout this triumphant march. Michael Arden took it all with evident pleasure. His face gleamed with delight. Several times the platform seemed seized with pitching and rolling like a weather-beaten ship. But the two heroes of the meeting had good sea-legs. They never stumbled— and their vessel arrived without dues at the port of Tampa Town. Michael Arden managed fortunately to escape from the last embraces of his vigorous admirers. He made for the Hotel Franklin, quickly gained his chamber, and slid under the bedclothes, while an army of a hundred thousand men kept watch under his windows. During this time a scene, short, grave, and decisive, took place between the mysterious personage and the president of the gun club. Barbicane, free at last, had gone straight to his adversary. "'Come,' he said shortly. The other followed him on the quay, and the two presently found themselves alone at the entrance of an open wharf on Jones' Fall. The two enemies, still mutually unknown, gazed at each other. "'Who are you?' asked Barbicane. "'Captain Nicholl. "'So I suspected. Hitherto chance has never thrown you in my way. "'I am come for that purpose.' You have insulted me. Publicly. And you will answer to me for this insult? At this very moment. 
No, I desire that all that passes between us shall be secret. There is a wood situated three miles from Tampa, the wood of Skursna. Do you know it? I know it. Will you be so good as to enter it tomorrow morning at five o'clock on one side? Yes, if you will enter at the other side at the same hour. And you will not forget your rifle, said Barbicane. No more than you will forget yours, replied Nicholl. These words, having been coldly spoken, the president of the gun club and the captain parted. Barbicane returned to his lodging, but instead of snatching a few hours of repose, he passed the night in endeavoring to discover a means of evading the recoil of the projectile, and resolving the difficult problem proposed by Michael Arden during their discussion at the meeting. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of From the Earth to the Moon」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Twenty One How a Frenchman Manages an Affair. While the contract of this duel was being discussed by the president and the captain, this dreadful savage duel in which each adversary became a man hunter, Michel Ardan was resting from the fatigues of his triumph. Resting is hardly an appropriate expression, for American beds rival marble or granite tables for hardness. Ardan was sleeping, then, badly enough, tossing about between the cloths which served him for sheets and he was dreaming of making a more comfortable couch in his projectile when a frightful noise disturbed his dreams. Thundering blows shook his door. They seemed to be caused by some iron instrument. A great deal of loud talking was distinguishable in this racket, which was rather too early in the morning. "'Open the door!' someone shrieked. "'For heaven's sake!' Ardan saw no reason for complying with a demand so roughly expressed. However, he got up and opened the door, just as it was giving way before the blows of this determined visitor. The secretary of the gun club burst into the room. A bomb could not have made more noise or have entered the room with less ceremony. "'Last night,' cried J. T. Maston, ex abrupto, "'our president was publicly insulted during the meeting. He provoked his adversary, who is none other than Captain Nicholl. They are fighting this morning in the wood of Scarsnaw.' I heard all the particulars from the mouth of Barbicane himself. If he is killed, then our scheme is at an end. We must prevent his duel, and one man alone has enough influence over Barbicane to stop him, and that man is Michel Ardan. While J. T. Maston was speaking, Michel Ardan, without interrupting him, had hastily put on his clothes, and in less than two minutes the two friends were making for the suburbs of Tampa Town with rapid strides. It was during this walk that Maston told Ardan the state of the case. He told him the real causes of the hostility between Barbicane and Nicholl, how it was of old date, and why, thanks to unknown friends, the president and the captain had, as yet, never met face to face. He added that it arose simply from a rivalry between iron plates and shot, and finally that the scene at the meeting was only the long-wished-for opportunity for Nicholl to pay off an old grudge. Nothing is more dreadful than private duels in America. The two adversaries attack each other like wild beasts. Then it is that they might well covet those wonderful properties of the Indians of the prairies, their quick intelligence, their ingenious cunning, their scent of the enemy. A single mistake, a moment's hesitation, a single false step may cause death. On these occasions Yankees are often accompanied by their dogs, and keep up the struggle for hours. What demons you are! cried Michel Ardan, when his companion had depicted this scene to him with much energy. "'Yes, we are,' replied J. T. modestly. "'But we had better make haste.' Though Michel Ardan and he had crossed the plains still wet with dew, and had taken the shortest route over creeks and rice-fields, they could not reach Scarsnaw in under five hours and a half. Barbicane must have passed the border half an hour ago. There was an old bushman working there, "'occupied in selling faggots from trees "'that had been leveled by his axe. "'Maston ran toward him, saying, 
Have you seen a man go into the wood, armed with a rifle? Barbicane, the president, my best friend? The worthy secretary of the gun club thought that his president must be known by all the world. But the bushman did not seem to understand him. A hunter? said Ardan. A hunter? Yes, replied the bushman. Long ago? About an hour. Too late, cried Maston. Have you heard any gunshots? asked Ardan. No, not one. Not one. That hunter did not look as if he knew how to hunt. What is to be done? said Maston. We must go into the wood at the risk of getting a ball which is not intended for us. Ah! cried Maston in a tone which could not be mistaken. I would rather have twenty balls in my own head than one in Barbicane's. Forward then. "'said Ardan, pressing his companion's hand. "'A few moments later the two friends had disappeared in the copse. "'It was a dense thicket in which rose huge cypresses, sycamores, "'tulip-trees, olives, tamarinds, oaks, and magnolias. "'These different trees had interwoven their branches "'into an inextricable maze through which the eye could not penetrate. "'Michel Ardan and Maston walked side by side in silence through the tall grass,' cutting themselves a path through the strong creepers, casting curious glances on the bushes, and momentarily expecting to hear the sound of rifles. As for the traces which Barbicane ought to have left of his passage through the wood, there was not a vestige of them visible. So they followed the barely perceptible paths along which Indians had tracked some enemy, and which the dense foliage darkly overshadowed. After an hour spent in vain pursuit, the two stopped in intensified anxiety. "'It must be all over,' said Maston, discouraged. "'A man like Barbicane would not dodge with his enemy, "'or ensnare him, would not even maneuver. "'He is too open, too brave. "'He has gone straight ahead, right into the danger, "'and doubtless far enough from the bushman "'for the wind to prevent his hearing the report of the rifles.' "'But surely,' replied Michel Ardan, "'since we entered the wood we should have heard.' "'And what if we came too late?' cried Maston, in tones of despair." For once Ardan had no reply to make, he and Maston resuming their walk in silence. From time to time, indeed, they raised great shouts, calling alternately Barbicane and Nicol, neither of whom, however, answered their cries. Only the birds, awakened by the sound, flew past them and disappeared among the branches, while some frightened deer fled precipitately before them. For another hour their search was continued. The greater part of the wood had been explored. There was nothing to reveal the presence of the combatants. The information of the bushman was after all doubtful, and Ardan was about to propose their abandoning this useless pursuit, when all at once Maston stopped. Hush, said he, there is someone down there. Someone? repeated Michel Ardan. Yes, a man. He seems motionless. His rifle is not in his hands. What can he be doing? But can you recognize him? asked Ardan, whose short sight was of little use to him in such circumstances. "'Yes, yes, he's turning toward us,' answered Maston. "'And it is?' "'Captain Nicholl!' "'Nicholl!' cried Michel Ardan, feeling a terrible pang of grief. "'Nicholl unarmed. He has, then, no longer any fear of his adversary.' "'Let us go to him,' said Michel Ardan, "'and find out the truth.' but he and his companion had barely taken fifty steps when they paused to examine the captain more attentively. They expected to find a bloodthirsty man happy in his revenge. On seeing him, they remained stupefied. A net, composed of very fine meshes, hung between two enormous tulip-trees, and in the midst of this snare, with its wings entangled, was a poor little bird, uttering pitiful cries, while it vainly struggled to escape. The bird-catcher who had laid this snare was no human being but a venomous spider, peculiar to that country, as large as a pigeon's egg, and armed with enormous claws. The hideous creature, instead of rushing on its prey, had beaten a sudden retreat and taken refuge in the upper branches of the tulip-tree, for a formidable enemy menaced its stronghold. Here, then, was Nicol, his gun on the ground, forgetful of danger, trying, if possible, to save the victim from its cobweb prison. At last it was accomplished, and the little bird flew joyfully away and disappeared. 
Nicol lovingly watched its flight, when he heard these words pronounced by a voice full of emotion. "'You are indeed a brave man!' He turned. Michel Ardan was before him, repeating in a different tone, "'And a kind-hearted one!' "'Michel Ardan!' cried the captain. "'Why are you here?' "'To press your hand, Nicol, and to prevent you from either killing Barbicane or being killed by him.' "'Barbicane,' returned the captain, "'I have been looking for him for the last two hours in vain. "'Where is he hiding?' "'Nicol,' said Michel Ardan, "'this is not courteous. "'We ought always to treat an adversary with respect. "'Rest assured, if Barbicane is still alive, "'we shall find him all the more easily, "'because if he has not, like you, "'been amusing himself with freeing oppressed birds, "'he must be looking for you. "'When we have found him, Michel Ardan tells you this, "'there will be no duel between you.' "'Between President Barbicane and myself,' gravely replied Nicholl, "'there is a rivalry which the death of one of us—' "'Pooh, pooh!' said Ardan. "'Brave fellows like you, indeed. You shall not fight.' "'I will fight, sir.' "'No.' "'Captain,' said J. T. Maston, with much feeling, "'I am a friend of the President's, his alter-ego, his second self. "'If you really must kill someone, shoot me. It will do just as well.' "'Sir,' Nicholl replied, seizing his rifle convulsively, "'these jokes—' "'Our friend Maston is not joking,' replied Ardan. "'I fully understand his idea of being killed himself in order to save his friend. "'But neither he nor Barbicane will fall before the balls of Captain Nicholl. "'Indeed, I have so attractive a proposal to make to the two rivals "'that both will be eager to accept it.' "'What is it?' asked Nicholl, with manifest incredulity. "'Patience!' exclaimed Ardan. "'I can only reveal it in the presence of Barbicane.' "'Let us go in search of him, then,' cried the captain. The three men started off at once, the captain having discharged his rifle threw it over his shoulder and advanced in silence. Another half-hour passed, and the pursuit was still fruitless. Maston was oppressed by sinister forebodings. He looked fiercely at Nicholl, asking himself whether the captain's vengeance had already been satisfied.' and the unfortunate Barbicane, shot, was perhaps lying dead on some bloody track. The same thought seemed to occur to Ardan, and both were casting inquiring glances on Nicholl, when suddenly Maston paused. The motionless figure of a man leaning against a gigantic catalpa twenty feet off appeared, half failed by the foliage. "'It is he,' said Maston. Barbicane never moved. Ardan looked at the captain, but he did not wince. Ardan went forward, crying, "'Barbicane! Barbicane!' No answer. Ardan rushed toward his friend, but in the act of seizing his arms he stopped short and uttered a cry of surprise. Barbicane, pencil in hand, was tracing geometrical figures in a memorandum book, while his unloaded rifle lay beside him on the ground. Absorbed in his studies, Barbicane, in his turn forgetful of the duel, had seen and heard nothing. When Ardan took his hand, he looked up and stared at his visitor in astonishment. "'Ah, it is you!' he cried at last. "'I have found it, my friend! I have found it!' "'What? My plan!' "'What plan?' "'The plan for countering the effect of the shock at the departure of the projectile.' "'Indeed,' said Michel Ardan, looking at the captain out of the corner of his eye. "'Yes, water, simply water, which will act as a spring.' "'Ah, Maston!' cried Barbicane. "'You here also?' "'Himself,' replied Ardan. "'And permit me to introduce you at the same time to the worthy Captain Nicholl.' "'Nicholl!' cried Barbicane, who jumped up at once. "'Pardon me, Captain. I had quite forgotten. I am ready.' Michel Ardan interfered, without giving the two enemies time to say anything more. "'Thank heaven,' said he. "'It is a happy thing that brave men like you two did not meet sooner.' "'We should now have been mourning for one or other of you. "'But thanks to Providence, which has interfered, "'there is now no further cause for alarm. "'When one forgets one's anger in mechanics or in cobwebs, "'it is a sign that the anger is not dangerous.' "'Michel Ardan then told the President "'how the captain had been found occupied. "'I put it to you now,' said he in conclusion. "'Are two such good fellows as you are "'made on purpose to smash each other's skulls with shot?' There was in the situation somewhat of the ridiculous, something quite unexpected, 
Michel Ardan saw this, and determined to effect a reconciliation. "'My good friends,' said he, with his most bewitching smile, "'this is nothing but a misunderstanding, nothing more. Well, to prove that it is all over between you, except frankly the proposal I am going to make to you.' "'Make it,' said Nicholl. "'Our friend Barbicane believes that his projectile will go straight to the moon?' "'Yes, certainly,' replied the President. "'And our friend Nicholl is persuaded it will fall back upon the earth?' "'I am certain of it,' cried the captain. "'Good,' said Ardan. "'I cannot pretend to make you agree, but I suggest this. "'Go with me, and so see whether we are stopped on our journey.' "'What?' exclaimed J. T. Maston, stupefied. "'The two rivals on this sudden proposal looked steadily at each other.' Barbicane waited for the captain's answer. Nicholl watched for the decision of the president. Well, said Michel, there is now no fear of the shock. Done, cried Barbicane. But quickly as he pronounced the word, he was not before Nicholl. Hurrah! Bravo! Hip, hip, hurrah! cried Michel, giving a hand to each of the late adversaries. Now that it is all settled, my friends, allow me to treat you after French fashion. Let us be off to breakfast. End of chapter 21、chapter、of From the Earth to the Moon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 22 The New Citizen of the United States. That same day, all America heard of the affair of Captain Nicholl and President Barbicane, as well as its singular denouement. From that day forth, Michael Arden had not one moment's rest. Deputations from all corners of the Union harassed him without cessation or intermission. He was compelled to receive them all, whether he would or no. How many people he was, hail, fellow, well met with! It is impossible to guess. Such a triumphal result would have intoxicated any other man, but he managed to keep himself in a state of delightful semi tipsiness. Among the deputations of all kinds which assailed him, that of the lunatics were careful not to forget what they owed to the future conqueror of the moon. One day, certain of these poor people, so numerous in America, came to call upon him. And requested permission to return with him to their native country. Singular hallucination, said he to Barbicane, after having dismissed the deputation with promises to convey numbers of messages to friends in the moon. Do you believe in the influence of the moon upon distempers? Scarcely. No more do I, despite some remarkable recorded facts of history. For instance, During an epidemic in 1693, a large number of persons died at the very moment of an eclipse. The celebrated Bacon always fainted during an eclipse. Charles VI relapsed six times into madness during the year 1399, sometimes during the new, sometimes during the full moon. Gall observed that insane persons underwent an accession of their disorder twice in every month. At the epochs of new and full moon. In fact, numerous observations made upon fevers, somnambulisms, and other human maladies seem to prove that the moon does exercise some mysterious influence upon man. But the how and the wherefore? asked Barbicane. Well, I can only give you the answer which Arago borrowed from the Plutarch, which is nineteen centuries old. Perhaps the stories are not true. In the height of his triumph, Michael Arden had to encounter all the annoyances incidental to a man of celebrity. Managers of entertainments wanted to exhibit him. Barnum offered him a million dollars to make a tour of the United States in his show. As for his photographs, they were sold of all size, and his portrait taken in every imaginable posture. More than half a million copies were disposed of in an incredibly short space of time. But it was not only the men who paid him homage, but the women as well. He might have married well a hundred times over, if he had been willing to settle in life. 
the old maids in particular, of forty years and upward, and dry in proportion, devoured his photographs day and night. They would have married him by hundreds, even if he had imposed upon them the condition of accompanying him into space. He had, however, no intention of transplanting a race of Franco-Americans upon the surface of the moon. He therefore declined all offers. As soon as he could withdraw from these somewhat embarrassing demonstrations, he went, accompanied by his friends, to pay a visit to the Columbiad. He was highly gratified by his inspection, and made the descent to the bottom of the tube of this gigantic machine, which was presently to launch him to the regions of the moon. It is necessary here to mention a proposal of J. T. Maston's, when the secretary of the gun club found that Barbicane and Nicole accepted the proposal of Michael Arden, he determined to join them, and make one of a smug party of four. So one day he determined to be admitted as one of the travellers. Barbicane, pained at having to refuse him, gave him clearly to understand that the projectile could not possibly contain so many passengers. Maston, in despair, went in search of Michael Arden, who counselled him to resign himself to the situation adding one or two arguments ad omnimum. "'You see, old fellow,' he said, "'you must not take what I say in bad part, "'but really, between ourselves, "'you are too incomplete a condition to appear in the moon.' "'Incomplete!' shrieked the valiant invalid. "'Yes, my dear fellow, imagine our meeting some of the inhabitants up there. "'Would you like to give them such a melancholy notion "'of what goes on down here, to teach them what war is?' to inform them that we employ our time chiefly in devouring each other, in smashing arms and legs, and that, too, on a globe which is capable of supporting a hundred billions of inhabitants, and which actually does contain nearly two hundred millions. Why, my worthy friend, we should have to turn you out of doors. But still, if you arrive there in pieces, you will be as incomplete as I am. Unquestionably, replied Michael Arden, but we shall not. In fact, a preparatory experiment, tried on the 18th of October, had yielded the best results, and caused the most well-grounded hopes of success. Barbicane, desirous of obtaining some notion of the effect of the shock at the moment of the projectile's departure, had procured a 38-inch mortar from the arsenal of Pensacola, he had this placed on the bank of Hillsborough Roads, in order that the shell might fall back into the sea, and the shock be thereby destroyed. His object was to ascertain the extent of the shock of departure, and not that of the return. A hollow projectile had been prepared for this curious experiment. A thick padding, fastened upon a kind of elastic network, made of the best steel, lined the inside of the walls. It was a veritable nest, most carefully wadded. "'What a pity I can't find room in there,' said J. T. Maston, regretting that his height did not allow of his trying the adventure. Within this shell were shut up a large cat and a squirrel belonging to J. T. Maston, and of which he was particularly fond. They were desirous, however, of ascertaining how this little animal, least of all other subjects to giddiness, would endure this experimental voyage. The mortar was charged with 160 pounds of powder, and the shell placed in the chamber. On being fired, the projectile rose with great velocity, described a majestic parabola, attained a height of about a thousand feet, and with a graceful curve descended in the midst of the vessels that lay there at anchor. Without a moment's loss of time, a small boat put off in the direction of its fall. Some divers plunged into the water, and attached ropes to the handles of the shell, which was quickly dragged on board. Five minutes did not elapse between the moment of enclosing the animals and that of unscrewing the coverlid of their prison. Arden, Barbicane, Maston, and Nicole were present on board the boat, and assisted at the operation with an interest which may readily be comprehended. Hardly had the shell been opened when the cat leaped out, slightly bruised, but full of life, and exhibiting no signs whatever of having made an aerial expedition. 
No trace, however, of the squirrel could be discovered. The truth at last became apparent. The cat had eaten its fellow traveller. J.T. Maston grieved much for the loss of his poor squirrel, and proposed to add its case to that of other martyrs to science. After this experiment, all hesitation, all fear disappeared. Besides, Barbicane's plans would ensure greater perfection for his projectile, and go far to annihilate altogether the effects of the shock. Nothing now remained but to go. Two days later, Michael Arden received a message from the President of the United States, an honor of which he showed himself especially sensible. After the example of his illustrious fellow-countryman, the Marquis de la Fayette, the government had decreed to him the title of Citizen of the United States of America. End of chapter 22